So Steve flies me out to Singapore. The Singapore is just on a different level. He's like, okay, let me take you out to this club. We start going out to this club. You can basically bid for the girl to come and drink with you. $10,000, $15,000, $20,000. It's a final bid for a girl, a Japanese blonde chick to come and drink with you, 80 Gs. And I look at that, I'm like, bro, there's literally levels to the levels. What would you do? If you could go back to square one when you were just getting started into this game, what would you do and how would you look at life knowing what you know now? But I want to start first with Luke. I mean, first, it's, it's a mindset shift. You know, it's it's understanding that 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 things are possible if you wield them into existence. And a lot of people dream about things that they want to achieve, but they never put in the action. And if you have a mentality and you have a dream and you have an ambition, you have to actualize it through your habits, through your behavior. And that's the first part. You can't just have wishful thinking. You need to be able to be in a situation whereby you take action. And take action isn't good enough. It means it needs to be repetitive, consistent action. Because we understand that consistency compounds. The compounding effect is extremely powerful. So now that you have your mindset shift, right, the second thing you need is self-education, right? We understand that only the educated are free. You can't just be a hustler and go out there and assume that you're going to make money. You need to understand what money is, where it comes from, how businesses work, how payment processing works. You need to understand how to build teams. You need to understand how to manage a uh, supply chain, how to fulfill whatever service or product you're, you're, you're fulfilling. And you need to become uh, a multi-chain, multi-skilled individual. This means that you need to become multi-vertical. So you, if you're, for example, running an e-commerce business, uh, you can't just be good at running ads, right? You need to be good at running ads, customer service, fulfillment. Uh, you need to understand the, the basics of payment processing, things of this nature, right? So uh, in my opinion, if I was starting from zero, now that I have self-education as one of the pillars, I have the self-belief as the second pillar. The third pillar is I need to be able to make money, right? In my opinion, still one of the most viable ways of making money is e-commerce. Today, I interviewed for Capital Club uh, two different individuals. Uh, one individual is doing $40 million a year in e-commerce, and the other is a dynamic duo that's making about $30 million in e-commerce. So I understand it's still a very viable option. Neil, for example, he is in the e-commerce space, but he's just selling in a different format, right? He's still selling through electronic commerce. If you look at Umar, he's still selling through electronic commerce, right? It's a SaaS product, it's not a physical product, but it's still electronic commerce, right? Same thing goes for Zane, right? There's still a, there's still an application that uh, he has an electronic commerce factor attached to it. So uh, my opinion is e-commerce, anything has to do with the internet is the best way to make money. Why? Because the barrier to entry is extremely low, right? And the margins can be extremely high if you understand how the market works. So what I see working right now that wasn't potentially the best uh, during 2022 due to uh, the markets not being good and supply chains being stressed uh, is e-commerce, right? And I was um, building a thesis around the best vehicle and the best way to make money in 2023. And yes, trading is a phenomenal way, but Umar can attest to it, right? I, I listened to one of his podcasts and he's like, okay, yeah, I make $50,000 on a trade, but I didn't make it in seven minutes or in seven hours. It, I made it in 10 years, right? And I agree with that. It's extremely valuable to trade. I love, I'm not a day trader myself. I, 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 I'm like a long-term investor. But I made my, my initial money through e-commerce. So that's what I can speak on. Steve got me into e-com. He flew me out. We were in, we were at one of his masterminds. Uh, he showed me $111,000 day. And my mindset mindset just shifted, right? This was like five years ago. And I was like, oh, fuck. Like, okay, this is a real deal thing. And he's just like refreshing the PNL and the old Shopify screen. He's like, look, bro, like you can actually do this as well. So I was like, okay, this is a, a, a viable option to make money. Uh, so a, a strategy that uh, is really useful if you don't have a lot of money, which we're talking about capital intensive businesses at the times, is uh, you are able to run TikTok organic, test a product. You don't have to have a, a lander. You don't have to have uh, a Shopify store. You just test products right through creatives, see what works, and then you can deploy it into running ads. And it's a good viable option. I, did, I actually did door-to-door -door sales when I was 18 for, for a summer. I was selling books, 100%. It is fundamentally one of the hardest things you will ever do. But if you can sell door-to-door, -door, you can do 
anything. Let me tell you guys real quick a, a party story. Uh, so Steve flies me out to Singapore. And he's like, bro, you want to see crazy rich Asian wealth? Because obviously Singapore, Singapore is just on a different level. He's like, okay, let me take you out to this club. We start going out to this club. And, and to the front of the club, there's like the bottle service girls. And uh, obviously, uh, you know, based on culture, you can basically bid for the girl to come and drink with you. So they start this dick cleaning contest of bidding, right? $5,000, $10,000, $15,000, $20,000, $40,000, $60,000, dollars so the final bid for a girl, a Japanese blonde chick to come and drink with you, 80 Gs. And I look at that, I'm like, bro, there's literally levels to the levels. And that's all based off of the exposure. Wait, 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 wait they wait, paid wait. 80 just for her come to come drink and- with you? <laughs> they could just buy the watch and the girl yeah, will go up Yeah, bro. <laughs> wait, yeah, bro. Did you, it's, it's, you get money, one? Bro. It, it, did you get if like one? It was just like whatever, right? Because you, you're, you're sitting on so much money. It just makes me, you realize, you know, if you're sitting on 100 grand, it's really not that much not to protect and not to do things of this nature. And some people may be like, oh, that's crazy. That's stupid. But some people look at money like monopoly paper. And it's like it really has no significance, no value whatsoever. And that's just because there's just so much abundance of it. So just levels to the levels. Yeah. So what people need to understand, first of all, is what is this debt that we're paying, right? And in order for you to understand that, you need to understand how money is created. There's a really good book that I recommend everybody read. It's called Lords of Easy Money. It tells you how money is created, right? How money goes from uh, wishful thinking to actually hitting uh, the government funds to then being dispersed to the top banks and then, of course, hitting it, hitting into your bank accounts. Now, the United States has debt, but the United States will never pay off its debt. Why? Because it only pays off its debt in its own currency, right? So it just has to print more money and therefore it pays off its own debts. Other countries, right? So, for example, country in Africa, their their currency or their 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 economy is based off of their local currency. Therefore, if anything is happening uh, with regards to the U.S. dollar, their debt is in dollars. So, these countries are going to be the ones struggling the most. The United States happens to just be in a situation right now where they are the global superpower of the world. And you see a lot of people talk about, oh, well, the yuan is going to replace the U.S. dollar. That's impossible. There's no chance that the yuan will ever replace the dollar because you need to understand how ch- the Chinese economy works, and it works like a like an enclosed capsule, right? It, it most of the most of the yuan exists inside of China, and it's a limited amount of yuan that can actually exit the market and be traded uh, or allowed to be invested in foreign markets. So you know a lot of Chinese billionaires, they're literally billionaires in China because they can't move their money out, and if they do, it's highly regulated. Uh, so I, I still believe that the U.S. is the strongest economic power in the world compared to what? Russia? Compared to what? China? It's there. It's, it's unequal. And attached to that, you have the military power. So the United States is the military power of the world. So we, you do have that going for you. So with regards to the debt ceiling, it's a, it's a bullshit illusion, right? This idea of debt ceiling, there's no such thing as a debt ceiling to the United States of America. It's an imaginary illusion. And the moment the printers start going on, the markets go on. And when the printers turn off, the markets turn off. And just compare, it's a very simple uh, analysis that you can do. Start looking at when the Fed stopped buying assets, right? That's when the market tanked. Start looking at when the Fed started buying assets. That's when the market tanked. And I was talking, I, I released it in the data sets channel on, on my Telegram. I had a conversation with the former governor of the Central Bank of Albania uh, at Capital Club. And he said, the, the economic policies of the world and the economic ebbs and flows of money are completely tied to the policy of the central bank. So if you understand and you study the policy of the central bank, then you will understand the ebbs and flows of the market because the central bank dictates when the money comes in, when the money goes out. And if you can understand these cycles, you will understand where the market is headed ahead of time. If you're a broker, the last thing you need to be worrying about <laughs> uh, on, on top of your paying your bills and taking care of your family is what the government is doing with monetary policy. Uh, as as much as it, and it could be a fear the tactic as well to to add to to your stress levels right but at the end of the day it's like the guys that it's good to have kind of like a perspective of what's going on but it shouldn't be your focus 
Right, your focus yeah. should be on development of your skill, development hey, of your what network. Is- I'm going I, to make money. I want to hear what what's something that you do on a daily basis. It's two. It's a double sided perspective. The first one is surrounding myself with people that are bigger and greater and more developed than myself. I think a part of my success has always come from being the smallest person in the room, feeling inadequate in the room in which I stand. I think it, it has sobered me. It's given me humility. And it has given me a perspective that there are levels to the levels. I do not want to be in an echo chamber every single day where I'm being worshipped, or where I'm being praised, where everybody's saying, oh, you're the best guy in town, you're the best guy around. I'm intentional about the rooms that I get in, the people that I surround myself with, and the energy that I share with people. So every room that I go into, I want to be a student. I want to be uh, listening. I want to be learning. That's the first side. On the second side is gratitude. You know, on a spectrum of wealth per se, any anywhere on the spectrum you lie, right? On the on the lowest side of the spectrum, you can have somebody that is, uh, let's say, in a third world country that lives in a farm village that has no money. On the other side of the spectrum, you have Elon Musk, right? Or people that are extremely wealthy. Somewhere in that spectrum is you. Now the question is. Where on the spectrum are you perceiving? Right? Are you perceiving what you don't have? Are you looking at people that have more than you that that have the things that you don't have? Are you looking at the other side of the spectrum of the people that you know you are more blessed than uh, the lives that they live? So when I place myself in the spectrum, wherever it is that I am, I tend to look at the people that have less, the people that are less fortunate, the people that have less opportunity, and uh, it gives me gratitude and it gives me sobriety of mind because. My journey is not about comparing myself to, oh, look at this guy that has a, a better house, or look at this person that has a better car. Or, there's always going to be somebody that has more and more and more. And in your journey as an entrepreneur, you're going to be in a situation where there's always going to be a dog with a bigger bone. Always. It's in perpetuity, always and forever. But being able to have gratitude, you know, position yourself in a room where people are educating you and humbling you, but simultaneously, not allowing comparison to steal your joy, you know, not looking at the person that has more followers, not looking at the person that has more influence or more money, but looking at those that have less and being like, you know what, where I was five years ago and where I am today, if I was looking at the dude that I was five years ago, I'd be proud. And having that sobriety of mind and gratitude and placing yourself in a circle where you are a student of life uh, is one of the things that I do every single day with intentionality in order to help me move forward.